This Week on Vaticano. Pope Francis resumes his usual schedule after the summer break, receiving guest delegations and people of all sorts in private audience. Also, get the latest updates on what's new in Rome. Come with us to the UN in Geneva for a look at the Holy See's activities there and discover how VR technologies are helping to carry out the mission of the Catholic Church. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. Today, more than 700 million people worldwide still do not have access to clean water. Dirty water is the primary cause of disease and death around the world. Faced with such a global problem, the Catholic Church isn't remaining silent. We have to uh, consider this question of water as a very, very important question. And after water, we, we, we have to, uh, uh, to educate and to, 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 to suggest for immediately uh, every people, and especially children, and especially young people, to take care of this, this creation and to take care of water because it's the condition of the future of life. Monsignor Bruno Marie Dufay is the second in charge of the Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development, designed by Pope Francis in 2016 to confront humanitarian issues. As you know, the question of ecology, the question of our environment, and the question of uh, care of creation, care of uh, uh, common home, as said uh, the Holy Father, is actually is a very important point in the Catholic social teaching. To raise awareness of ecological issues, the Catholic Church, together with the Orthodox Church, celebrates on the 1st of September the World Day of Prayer for the Care of Creation. In this year's message, I wish to draw attention once again to the question of water, a primary good to protect and make available to everyone. In the message, the Pope reflects on two aspects, respect for water as a precious resource and access to water as a human right. This day is a prayer, so it has a prayer dimension. We are not an ecologist agency. The Church prays and prays alongside other Christians because the problem touches every person. Recent pontiffs have been attentive to the issue of the environment. Saint John Paul II, after his first visit to Africa, personally saw the great tragedy lived by people due to lack of water and made a call to action. And so the Holy Father thought about creating a foundation, a foundation that covers nine countries of the Sahel region, especially for small projects linked to water, wells, regulatory systems for small communities, small villages, etc. Since 1984, it has undertaken some 4,500, nearly 5,000 projects, small in nature. As um, a, a person responsible for the apostleship of the sea, uh, that is the ministry of the Catholic Church that cares for uh, seafarers and fishers and their family, water is life for us. Why? Because the fishermen, they get their uh, living from, uh, from the sea. But also the uh, shipping, people live on board of a merchant shipping vessel for nine months, for 12 months. They are always at sea. That's why water is important for us as apostleship of the sea, because people, they get their sustainment, they live on the water. We have to say that creation is a gift. It's a gift that has been given from God to us. We have received it, but it's not only for us, we have to pass this gift to the other. So that's why we have to care for creation. And we should not destroy everything with us, like we have received it from the generation before us and we are passing it on to others.
Pope Francis received bishops of Sudan and South Sudan during their ad limina apostolorum visit to Rome. The referendum held on July 9, 2011, divided Sudan into Muslim North and Christian South, making South Sudan the youngest state in the world. The internal ongoing conflict has increased poverty in both countries and forced thousands to emigrate. This February, Pope Francis held a day of prayer for peace in South Sudan and expressed his desire to visit the country. But the situation is dangerous and still unsafe for an apostolic visit. After greeting the Pope one by one, the Sudanese bishops offered him a large portrait of their patron saint, Saint Josephine Bakita. Pope Francis received the credentials of a new ambassador of the Philippines to the Holy See, Grace Relucio Princesa. Miss Princesa has worked in diplomacy for nearly three decades. She's a devout Catholic and mother of five children. Holy Mary, Mother of God, this week, Pope Francis received a rather unique gift. This personalized 1971 Vespa 50R was a present from the Vespa Nel Tempo Club. The license plate is an abbreviation of Bergoglio, Francis, the year of his birth, and the date the gift was given. The Pope showed his appreciation and said that to ride a Vespa must be great fun. He then handed the scooter over to his almoner, Cardinal Konrad Krajewski. 600 Vespa riders were gathered in Rome for their second international meeting, Roma Caput Vespa. One of the highlights of the program was a participation in the Sunday Angelus Prayer at St. Peter's Square. Thanks for watching. Get ready to take a look at Holy See Diplomacy in Action. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. Religions, creeds and other value systems joining forces to enhance equal citizenship rights was the motto of this one-day event that took place here at the UN Geneva at the end of June. However, the subject matter is timeless and its implementation in its infancy. This equality has its origin in, and I quote from the document Nostre Etate of the Second Vatican Council, one is, in, is the community of all peoples, one their origin, for God made the whole human race to live over the face of the earth. Monsignor Vitillo, did God also made or established different religions? God created people, and he invited people to be in a relationship with him. People themselves established different religions at first because they were searching for how to relate to God. And uh, then uh, God revealed himself to the Jewish people as a personal God with whom they could have this relationship. And also he sent us his son to bring about the fulfillment of uh, the Judaic law in, in Christianity. Um, Many different religions developed uh, because people are still searching, but it wasn't that God established different religions. The moral lobby of faith that is still strong across the world must act in cohesion to ensure that equal citizenship rights and human dignity are at the forefront of all developmental efforts. We are not put on this earth to go forth and multiply, desecrate and destroy, but to bring life and hope for future generations. Do you think the, the conference like this year is, is uh, capable of doing this or inspire people, encourage people to do that? Absolutely. I think the conference, when we talk about equal citizenship, was a call in many ways for us to see how much we have in common and also to be able to uh, promote uh, the policies and the practices, not just of faith traditions, but of states and, and other authorities so that we could have the basis of solidarity with each other. Unity and diversity, this must be the objective of each and every one of us. This is the only way to push us towards renewed solidarity, because our roots, our common roots, our morals, our lifestyles in our religions are based on the fundamental principle, loving one's neighbor. Now, isn't the problem to mix different religions, creeds and value systems, put them or try to put them under one roof 
as some of them have laws that may violate uh, the laws of the others. If we really get down to the essentials uh, of religious uh, uh, practice and, and belief, we see that there are many common values that we share. Uh, the whole uh, sense of, of being in solidarity with each other, of loving God with all that we have to love, and also of loving our neighbors as ourselves. They're, they're basic tenets in many of the major faith traditions. Uh, so there's a lot more that we share in common than our differences for us. Certainly there are some beliefs and some practices that, that differ. Uh, but if we focus on what the essential values are in most of the major faith traditions, we have a lot in common. There cannot be any understanding, there cannot be any dialogue without any freedom nor any justice. The values of justice and freedom paves the way for humans to get ready and to seek ways and means to use the opportunity to enhance dialogue. Let us also, at this time, in this conference, use this opportunity to build relationships among ourselves, but to primarily to build a safe and stronger world and a stronger humanity. Let us commit ourselves to do that in an inclusive way built for our multi-religious world. Next week, in part two of our report, we will speak about equal citizenship rights of refugees and migrants and ask the co-executive secretary of the sponsoring committee of the conference about his suggestion to set up a task force on equal citizenship rights. The conference participants agreed that the spread of equal citizenship rights is the gateway to the concept of global citizenship, a gateway, in other words, to world peace. These are the victims of armed conflicts. They're persecuted because of race, religion or political status and they're forcibly displaced people uprooted from their families, culture and homes. They are refugees. There are an estimated 68 and a half million refugees in the world. Imagine, that's the entire population of the United Kingdom forcibly displaced from their homes. There's a Catholic organization based in Rome called the Jesuit Refugee Service that's been seeking to accompany, serve and advocate for the cause of fleeing refugees for nearly 40 years. The international director, Father Thomas Smolich, explains the heart of their work. We are echoing the words of Pope Francis, who has been very strong about the four verbs that each of us needs to be putting into practice individually and as a community. The idea to welcome, to protect, to promote, and to integrate. And JRS, working with our partners in Spain, Antrical Taurus, see this as a real opportunity to see those four, world, those four words as words that open the world especially for, the, for students, uh, young people who have been forcibly displaced throughout the world. Implementing 150 projects in 52 countries, Jesuit Refugee Service, in brief, JRS, has served hundreds of thousands of people. Education is the game changer. Education gives young people the opportunity to think differently, to imagine a different future, to have the kind of education that gives them hope, that gives them stability, allows them to find work that puts food on the table, sends their children to school. JRS firmly, firmly believes that an integral part of what the Pope is talking about is to offer young people a seat in school, to offer young people the opportunity to learn and to become productive people in our world. We are primarily focusing that edu those educational efforts in three areas. One is on secondary education, especially giving girls the opportunity to stay in school. 
Another key area for us is teacher training, training, improving the quality of teaching, improving the way that um, young people are able to learn. And an, an area which we're also focusing on now is what we're calling professional and post-secondary education. Giving those who have graduated from high school or have finished a secondary degree the skills that they need to become employed, to be able to support themselves and their families. According to JRS's 2017 annual report, 52% of refugees are children, and as they grow up, access to education drops tremendously. Less than 1% continue to pursue higher education. In response, JRS started the Global Education Initiative to increase the scale and impact of its educational projects for young refugees. Within three years, roughly 200,000 refugees have benefited from their educational programs. One of the main countries JRS focuses on is Lebanon, due to a quarter of the population being Syrian refugees. There, they give children the opportunity to learn English and French in order to participate in the Lebanese school system. In addition to deal with, to help them and their families deal with the psychosocial needs that are often part of displacement, which are often part of the trauma of having had to leave home, of having had to see things that a young child or anybody should never, should never see, to deal, help deal with some of the stresses that inevitably impact family lives in these forced displacement situations. While the camps may be small, they are still camps. It is not home, and yet people are there for now indeterminate periods of time. To help the world understand what the refugee situation is in Lebanon and in other places, JRS is working on a multi-dimensional project in collaboration with EWTN's Rome Bureau. Postgrad Harvard student Benjamin Crockett visited refugee camps in Lebanon and Malawi filming in VR. My goal was to bring some of the best technology we have available. Uh, so the Samsung 360 camera is an extraordinary little, you know, uh, R2D2-like uh, camera. So we brought that one and we brought the GoPro Omni. And our mission was to document as much as we can to share it with, uh, with people. Because virtual reality is this brand new, I mean, amazing technology that allows people to more or less experience what it's like to be another person. And so we put this camera in, in classrooms, in camps in Lebanon. The hope is that by putting people in the shoes of refugees through virtual reality, they'll react and act. I think uh, we were trying to find a way to document and to kind of share the universal humanity. A uh, child is a child, it doesn't matter if they're in Syria, if they're in the US, or if they're in Europe. Um, they, they want the same things. They want to be loved, they want you know, people to pay attention to them. And I think with, uh, with a virtual reality camera, if you can put it um, in, in a playground or in a classroom uh, to allow people to be there and to sit with these children and to see what they're experiencing, um, you realize that, um, that we're, all, we're all the same. And so that for me was, was enormously impactful. Technologies such as virtual reality have a massive potential to show the world the brutal reality of being a refugee. In a few moments, we'll be back with more on Vaticano. More on Vaticano begins now. Just a few miles from the Vatican, these two hectares of land have become a promised land for 12 refugees. Warmed by the Roman sun and animated by chirping cicadas, these gardens are the global headquarters of the St. Vincent de Paul Congregation. It's a dream come true for Father Giuseppe Carulli, creator of Mediterranea, a project that aims to integrate migrants through farming. Father says the idea came to him last year. Walking through the spacious grounds, he asks himself, how can this garden be more useful? And soon enough, he'd found the answer. If we give them the chance, asylum seekers and refugees could benefit 
from this rich soil. Then the project started. Yet another big challenge was to integrate these guys because they were coming from various nations, such as uh, Mali, Gambia, Senegal, Rwanda, Mauritania, Nigeria. We also have a young man who even comes from Iran. In total, there are 12, nine boys and three girls, of whom two are young mothers. Initially, they did not know each other. Uh, having seen them here together, the initial fear was that they would not integrate with each other. And it is fundamental to the project. But they, they surprised us, because the challenge then now has become the greatest satisfaction for us. Now we can say that this group lives like a family, as if they have always known each other. The project has already borne its first fruits. 25-year-old Angela Okafor is a Catholic from Nigeria. In this project, I'm in the section of the vegetables, which is called the autos. So I'm helping to, my section is here, so I occupy this space. When the vegetables, when they are ready to be uprooted, I take them. Thanks to funding from the Vincentians and a refugee cooperative, each migrant earns about $460 a month. The aim is for the project to become self-funding as soon as possible so the migrants can become self-sufficient. We have started with a fund, with a contribution given to us by the Vincentian missionaries of Italy, with whom we have combined all of this. Now we are looking for more funds to allow them to continue. In this phase, the members support themselves with the funds of the European community, which through the municipality of Rome issues to them in the form of training internships. Along with the kitchen garden, they also have workspaces for carpentry and metalworks. Lydia Tropiano heads this section and helps design garden furniture and plant holders. I'm an interior designer, but also they helped me to build the items till the end. So it was really a teamwork, a perfect teamwork. So we do chairs and tables and bases, and we made them on measurement. So everything, everyone who wants to buy something, we can do it like as he wants. The motto at the workshop is nothing gets thrown away. And indeed, old pallets and trimmed branches pass through the creative hands of young Edobor to become flower stands. Yeah, this wood is a, a cycle. So we can make it, use it to make a vase, like a, a pot of flower. God is important in my life. Because if it's not God, I'm not to be alive today because I passed through many, many things in my life to be here today. We are a big family and I love it here. It's so important for me to speak with them and to, I don't know, to open my mind. To get here is difficult. Yeah, because I have a problem in my country, so I have to leave my country so that I will not die young. So when we get to Libya, Libya is, everybody knows Libya is, is a war country. Yeah, you cannot have a free movement like this. Even you can go to the supermarket, you will not come back. So I have to decide, and I make this furniture in Libya. Yes, I make it. So I have to decide, I will not die in Libya, so I have to come to Europe to have my own future in my life. How did you come? Yes, I come with the boat. Co-founder of the Mediterranean project, Margherita Grasselli, says stories like Edibor's gives her the enthusiasm to continue pushing this project forward. Every time that uh, I stay here as a volunteer, working with them, uh, sharing lunch uh, and the free time also, uh, it's very important because you feel uh, that uh, what you receive uh, every day is more than uh, what you give, respecting what you give. Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure that staying with them is something that uh, uh, spiritually enriched you a lot, but I would like to, tra to transmit, uh, to, to report this experience to other people uh, because uh, this project uh, should be um, 
should be an example of what you can do, of what church can do, every day and everywhere. This is what is important in my opinion. We cannot be afraid about these incoming people, about refugees, because they are something that can reach us a lot every day. The refugee garden also includes a walnut and citrus grove, a Mediterranean herb section and one of the biggest Cosmea flower collections in Europe. There are 20 different types ready for sale and Rafael Augustin from Nigeria is proud to take care of the flower section. I feel very happy and not just that, each time I'm working with these flowers, it's like something it means very, very, very happy because each time I take a look at these flowers, I, I get dressed from them like, like flowers to me, they are something that has colors to the nature, so I love working with flowers, they are very beautiful. They make the environment very beautiful, and I love making the environment beautiful, so I love working with flowers. Yeah, our hope for this project is for it to grow more, for it to go like worldwide, so everybody will know about it, so people can support the project and they can help us, because they can see the beautiful work we are doing so they can invest on it, so we can make something more beautiful than this.